Uh, when, when I was a kid, approximately 135 years ago, I watched Bugs Bunny on TV. Yeah, I did. It was super fun. I loved all the Looney Tunes. And Bugs Bunny, I will, I will never forget, like, uh, how many years later, I remember this episode where there was this hairy monster that was trying to eat Bugs Bunny or whatever, devour him. And so Bugs Bunny immediately just out of nowhere starts being a beauty salon <laughs> operator <laughs> and doing his nails with a, like a file like you would use on the car engine or something, a file, and p- parting his hair and everything. And, and Bugs Bunny just takes on this persona of a, of a cosmetologist, I guess, and, and he goes, oh, I just, I think monsters are the most interesting people. Do you, anybody else besides me remember this? And they must go to the most interesting places. Well, you can see, here's my segue. Jesus also met the most interesting people. That loves it. That's just that's the whole connection. Not really much spiritual in that. But I was just thinking how Jesus hung out with a lot of very interesting people, uh, all different kinds of people. He hung out with the respected for example. So he hung out with the Pharisees, who were some of the most godly, uh, uh, Bible-believing, Bible-obeying people. Jesus hung out with other Jewish religious leaders. But he also hung out with the hurting, with people who were blind or crippled or lame or people who were grieving a recent loss in their lives. Jesus was with those people and ministering to them. Jesus hung out with the outcasts, And we heard a little bit last week from Pastor Christian about the people who were lepers, people who who in Jesus' day had uh, the skin disease that, that made them an outcast, like they could not even be around their friends or family. Jesus touched the lepers. And I, I was doing some reading this week, and I, I realized that was one of the most frequent healings he did. You hear that over and over, that he healed someone with leprosy. And it's just, it's, uh, I think, uh, just shows the heart of God, how he is for everybody. Jesus hung out with the despised as well. The people around Jesus hated tax collectors. Unlike us, we love tax collectors today. Uh, but in that day, it was like sinners equals tax collectors because they were kind of bad. Okay, they were. Uh, And Jesus hung out with other notorious or famous or immoral sinners, people that his society had labeled sinners. So we're going to look today uh, at some people that Jesus was hanging out with. Would you turn with me in the Bible to Luke chapter 7, verse 36? Luke 7, 36. We read from the NLT, so if you've got it on a smartphone or tablet, choose that, and then you'll be reading the same one. And I love it when you get out the Bible because then you can see what comes before, what comes after. You can uh, take notes, uh, all that stuff. And I believe God's going to speak to you. So now this incident is often confused with another incident where uh, the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and John, they talk about a similar incident with Jesus, but this one is something that happened early in Jesus' ministry. Okay, so very early in, in Jesus' public ministry as an adult. And here's what happened. Verse 36. One of the Pharisees, who we later find out his name was Simon, asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. So there's a little hint in there how we know. One one of the reasons we know it was early in his ministry because he's still hanging out with Pharisees in a nice, friendly meal. (laughs) So eventually, the Pharisees, oh, not so good when it came time for the cross. Uh, But uh, here here he is. This Pharisee has said, hey, why don't you come on over? And, And literally, that word when it says that in the NLT, he sat down to eat, The literally the word is he reclined at the table. So in Jesus' day, if you were poor, you sat on the floor. If you were more well-to-do, you, you leaned on cushions or like a little low, six inches off the floor kind of thing, couch around the table. So you'd lean on your left arm and eat with your right. And uh, everyone, it was just a very relaxed, very um, family, socially oriented kind of a feeling. So he was at an affluent home this, this uh, Simon the Pharisee. And I, I picture it like this. Jesus is out ministering, and it would be sort of like if Billy Graham came to town, 
And he's ministering the, during the day and preaching and teaching and whatever. And then one of the local religious leaders, one of the local church leaders would have him over for dinner at night. It was kind of like that. That's the setting. So Jesus is out ministering. Pharisee says, come to my house. So he did. So Simon, the Pharisee, invited Jesus in to his home. And we know, uh, from, as it goes on with the details of the story, there were many others also, probably Jesus' disciples and probably some other Pharisees. At least those two groups most likely were there because it was a bit of a group. So Jesus followed Simon as he walked through the courtyard or the common area in the middle of the house. And I've got a picture to show you, just sort of an artist's rendering uh, based on excavations and all that, that there would have been a, a common, when I think of courtyard, I think of like out. We call it the plaza. I think of outdoors, but this would be within the house with rooms all around the courtyard. So Jesus followed Simon as he, as he walked through the courtyard. They could smell the smoke from the cooking fire. Okay, no electric oven <laughs> in that day. They could hear farm animal sounds because the animals would have been in the house in, in one of the rooms that was kind of designated for the animals. And they could hear those goats and those chickens. And, you know, they're probably making some noise because they think they might be next for dinner. Who knows? But so these guys are all reclining around their table very properly on their left elbows, uh, eating roasted fish and baked bread with their right hand, talking about all the miracles that Jesus had done that day. That's the setting. Verse 37. When a certain immoral or or the, the word could be said sinful, woman from that city heard Jesus was eating there. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. And it, it sounds like she just let herself into the house. Now, in the Mediterranean, it's a very warm climate. Uh, the roof was used as a room. Like, it's just a very outdoors, warm climate. So I'm guessing the front door is open if there was a door. And she just walked in. She heard Jesus was going to be there, and she just walked in with this beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. So she had obviously had some type of life-changing, powerful encounter with Jesus during the day. Jesus had changed her life, and she was extremely grateful. She was weeping tears of joy for him and for what he had done in her life. She brought a very valuable offering, this uh, expensive perfume, and anointed Jesus' feet with it. It would be like if she brought... Um, Coco Mademoiselle by Chanel, $2,000 for four ounces. It's like that. That's, that's what she brought to him. Now, I, I do want to just clarify there are two, at least two, possibly even three stories where Jesus was anointed by someone. This, this one's kind of unique to Luke. Uh, this is the one that happened early in his ministry. So down in verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, saw this woman kissing his feet, anoint, pouring this expensive perfume on his feet, and, and all of that. When the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Now, we a lot of times kind of focus in on the fact that he is speaking disparagingly of this woman, but what I really noticed this time as I read this, he is doubting who Jesus is. That's really the issue. He's saying he must not be the prophet or a prophet. He must not be this famous guy. He must not be Billy Graham. Because if he was Billy Graham, he would know who's touching him and he would not allow this. He must not be the prophet. So Jesus knew what Simon the Pharisee was thinking. I don't know if he said it, you know, like kind of whispered it to himself, Jesus heard it, or if Jesus read his thoughts. I don't know how, but Jesus knew what he was thinking. NLT says, Jesus answered his thoughts. <laughs> I love that. And he said, Simon. And Simon's like, what? Yes. Simon, Jesus said, uh, Simon, I, I, I got someone I want to talk to you about. Okay, bring it on. Simon's like, yes, this is awesome, private audience with Jesus. And so Jesus tells a story. We call it a parable. A man loaned money 
to two different people. I loaned money to you, I loaned money to you. To the one person, he loaned 500 silver coins. This would be just under two years' wages. So say $70,000. So he loaned $70,000 to one person. To the other person, he loaned 50 silver coins. That would be like saying almost two months' wages. So what would that be? Maybe $3,000 or $4,000 or something like that. So two, two people uh, loaned very different loans, probably different, very different kinds of people with very different needs. Why would someone even need a loan for two years' worth of wages? Why would someone need a loan for just a couple months' wages? So two different people, yet they had something in common. Jesus said they could not pay their debt on their own. Even though they were very different sizes, even the guy that had the smaller debt, he couldn't afford to pay and so the guy who lent, the lender, forgave or canceled their debts. Okay, guy who owes me two years' wages, you're free. Guy who owes me two months' wages, you're free. Wow. And Jesus asked him this chilling question. Simon, who would love the lender more? And Simon said, well, I suppose the one who was forgiven the bigger debt. The one who's forgiven the bigger debt. Jesus said in Luke 7, 43, that's right. That's right, Jesus said. And then Jesus begins to draw a contrast. Remember, he told a story about two different kinds of people, but they had something in common. Then Jesus begins to tell us, uh, to, be, uh, to draw a contrast, and he says, he says, excuse me, he turned to the woman, but he talked to Simon. <laughs> turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. She's kissing his feet. She's anointing him with oil, with perfume. Simon, when I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, so in that day they might have uh, like kissed both, both cheeks, you know, even for guys. You didn't greet me with a kiss. But from the, the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy, Simon, of olive oil to anoint my head. But she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and, and they are many. I get it. I get what you're thinking, Simon. Her sins are many. But they have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Wow. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. I already told you that when I ministered to you earlier. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Wow. Who are you in this story? There's two people here. Simon lived a very godly life. He followed all the rules, and that is very good. I, I would say that Jesus probably had the most in common with the Pharisees in terms of beliefs and practice. Um, he followed all the rules. Simon was famous for helping others follow, obey God's law. The Pharisees did a lot for their country, actually. They, they helped people follow God. The, but Simon, he did not think that he needed much help spiritually, Pretty much got it going on, if you know what I mean. He probably thought of Jesus as a peer or as a friend. I'm just going to have a friend over to dinner. It's an honored friend, but still a friend. And Simon invited Jesus into his home. So are you Simon or the sinner? The sinner lived a wild life. Uh, it's possible that she was actually a prostitute, that this was a euphemism, that she was a sinful woman, a notorious sinful woman. Uh, and that made her famous for different reasons. So Simon is famous for certain reasons. She's famous for certain reasons. But she had encountered Jesus earlier that day, and Jesus offered her a new life, eternal life. She put her faith in Jesus, and she found love, acceptance, and forgiveness that she had been searching for all her life. She found it in Jesus. She thought of Jesus not as a peer, but as a Savior, without whom she would be eternally lost. 
Later, a later church leader, Paul, wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.17, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And that's what had happened in this woman's life. She was eternally grateful to Jesus, and she demonstrated it. She did not just have a thankful attitude. She had thankful behavior. She expressed it. She demonstrated it by bowing at Jesus' feet. And, and she was just crying tears of joy, and she realized, oh, they're falling on his feet. She, she unloosed her hair or loosened her hair, which was a sign of humility, and wiped his feet with her hair. So this is his dirtiest, uh, uh, you know, his, his, his parts of his body that were exposed to the, the dust. Back in that day, no, you know, no, no paved roads, no sidewalks. So he's just walking through the dust and the mud, and she's cleaning him off with her hair. She takes this, mo- probably her most expensive treasure. It's, it's worth a lot of money. Breaks the jar and pours the oil on his feet. Wow, she's demonstrating her gratitude, and that's the power of gratitude. The power of gratitude transforms you from someone who invites Jesus in, like the Pharisee did invite Jesus in, but the power of gratitude transforms you from someone who invites Jesus in to someone who pursues Jesus with all your heart. That's the power of gratitude. It can take you from someone who says, yes, I'm a Christian. I've invited Jesus in to a person who is so grateful for what Jesus has done in your life that you pursue Jesus with all of your heart. You're after him. You're seeking him. You just want to spend time with him. You want to hear his heartbeat so you can do what he wants you to do and be ready to go where he wants you to go. That's a very different person. The, the, the uh, Simon or the sinner. The woman in the story outworships all of us, myself included. She outworshipped all of us that day. So many times you hold back from really entering into worship because you're so concerned about what people around you might think. You, you're, uh, you're asking yourself, like, well, what if the people around me think I'm too emotional? Or what if they think I'm not acting very dignified? Or what if they think I can't sing? Or I, 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 I have no rhythm? Or what, what if the people around me are, are thinking, wow, you are, I, I don't really know how to say fancy prayers. Have you ever really given sacrificially, generously to Jesus your time, your talent, or your treasure, that's a worship. Have you ever given Jesus something as valuable to you as a little jar of Coco Marmoselle by Chanel? Have you ever given Jesus something that you valued that much? There are people in the Bible who gave Jesus their child. Hannah said, if you give me a son, Samuel, I will give him to you. She gave him her Coco Marmoselle. She gave the most valuable thing that she had. Maybe you're afraid that you're going to miss out on something if you give something financially or, or you give your time. Or, or maybe you're afraid you won't be able to pay your bills. Well, then you probably don't quite yet know God. <laughs> because when he pours through you, as you know, he makes it up. He, he just does. God is not a taker. He's a giver. So this is, there's a very predictable action step after, after reading this Bible passage, seeing the woman's example. It's obvious what we're supposed to do. Be like the woman. Just kneel at Jesus' feet, give him everything, express your gratitude to Jesus through extravagant worship. But in reality, that's not as easy as it might sound. It, it may be very uncomfortable. You can try to hype up your gratitude, so you can be as, just as hyper as her, you know, crying, perfuming, wiping, all that stuff. You could try to hype it up, but you can't just flip a switch and suddenly become an extravagant worshiper. So that's sort of an outcome. 
But what you can do is an, is an input. You can meditate on what Jesus has done for you and who you would be without him. That's what she was doing. She realized, oh, wow, I was on the path of destruction. Wow. And she realized now she's on a path to eternal life. Jesus is the greatest extravagant giver who ever lived. He is God, God the Son. He left heaven where everyone praised and adored him. Everyone obeyed his slightest word or command to, to take on flesh and bones, walk among us, where everyone questioned every little thing he said or did, even when it was good and helpful. They questioned it. They challenged him. They, they doubted him. I, this, surely this can't be a prophet if he doesn't even know who that woman is. That's such a, he gave up all of that status and took on flesh and blood. And then he went to the cross and he broke the alabaster jar of his life out. He broke it and poured it out for you and for me. He gave his blood, not just perfume that makes us smell good, but his blood that cleans up our lives, that cleans up our insides, that, gives, that makes us new and changes us. He did all that so that you could be forgiven, so you could have eternal life, so your body could be healed, so you could be delivered and set free. Does that make you feel grateful? Even the tiniest bit? We've heard it so many times, and you hear it in church, God's done so much, it's so great and everything, but w let's just stop and think, what has he done in you and for you? Do you know that Jesus died for you? It's your fault he died. It's my fault he did, died. My fault, my sin. That, that is why he came to die. And he did that for you and for me. Wow. That makes me feel grateful. The power of gratitude transforms you from someone who merely invites Jesus in to someone who pursues Jesus with all your heart. In Psalm 103, a man named David started thinking about God's grace and his mercy, and his love, and forgiveness. In verse 3, he writes, he forgives all my sins. Would you just take a moment and list them? Just start listing your sins. If you think you have none, yikes. <laughs> because we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Have you ever gossiped? Okay, done. <laughs> We've all sinned. We've all sinned. And he forgives them all. He heals all my diseases. Would you list them? List them. What, what has God healed you from? What has he healed you from? He redeems me from death. The, the, literally, the word is a pit. Would you list the times that God has spared your life? And honestly, if you're a driver, you don't know, even know how many times God has spared your life. <laughs> It's been hundreds. <laughs> he fills my life with good, with good things. Would you list them? Just take a moment and start listing good things. If you were able to walk in this morning, there's number one. If you are breathing right now, there's another one. If you have heard the, the gospel, like many people on the earth have never heard, there's another. Do you know how many good things God has filled your life with? And by the way, this is the best antidote for depression or anxiety. It's listing and thanking God for all the good things he has done for you. I'm going to skip down to verse 10. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. And then a little bit later in verse 11, he gives us three beautiful pictures of God's love and forgiveness for you. And I hope these inspire you. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. So God's love for you is miles and miles and miles high. That's his love for you. It's not like a little love. It is huge love. It's vast love. Verse 12, he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. If you go to the equator and you just start going east, 
you will never stop going east. You'll never, you'll never get to where you're suddenly going west. You're just always going east. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far God has taken your sins. And he said, I'm not thinking about them. Why are you? They're gone. What sin? They're gone. They're gone. Verse 13, the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. So in light of all that God has done for you, this is how he ends it. And I think we should end it the same way that he ends the psalm. Let all that I am praise the Lord. Let everything I am. And I've only just taken just a couple of minutes just to begin to list some of the things God has done for you. He's done so much more than that. Amen. The power of your gratitude towards God will transform your life. It will, trans it will make you into a different kind of person, a person who pursues Jesus rather than just inviting him in for dinner and keeping him at arm's length. Yeah. So good. Would you stand with me right where you are? And if you're uh, online, would you, would you make where you are a place of prayer? And let's, we're going to pray. We're going to talk to Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me? And, and let's just pray together. Lord, I just want to say thank you. And uh, church, if you can hear me and you are thankful, would you just say thank you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for every good thing that you've done. We know, Father, that every good and perfect gift comes down from you, the Father of lights, who never shifts or, or, um, or shakes. We praise you. We thank you for every good thing. You've healed our, sin, our, our diseases. You've, you've forgiven our sins. You made us new. You're delivering us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for everything that you are. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be truly grateful. I, I know that my message alone cannot make a, a people grateful. But your Holy Spirit working in our hearts, reminding us of what you've done and who you are, that can change us. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come, that you would change us, that you would work in us and make us truly grateful people. May we become extravagant worshipers. May our demonstration to you, our expression to you be extravagant. May we be the kind of people that sit at your feet and cry tears of joy and bring you our most treasured possession, our, our costly oil, our son, our everything to you, Lord. May we be that kind of worshiper. Lord, may we, may we have a church, a congregation of extravagant worshipers. Lord, in Jesus' name, if you would like Jesus to transform you from just where you are to being a, an extravagant worshiper, would you just raise your hand? And my hand is up first. I want to be a more extravagant worshiper. Yes. So Jesus, you see our hands. Send your Holy Spirit Pour out your spirit on us that next Sunday when we gather, it's different. It's a different place because we are, we are crying tears of joy in your presence. Now, I, I pray that this week as we're having devotions, as we're reading your word or praying to you, that tears of joy would come because we, we're beginning to understand how high, deep, wide, and long is the love of God for us. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. You can put your hands down. While we're still praying, I just want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. I don't know if you've already done this or not. I don't know every person in the room. I don't know where you're at. I don't know every person online where you're at. But I want to ask you and I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus, just like the woman in the story did today. She put her faith. She was not questioning, oh, I, I wonder if he's the, the prophet. I wonder if he's who he, he, she experienced him. I want you to experience him. I want you to have that experience for yourself. How do you do that? Turn from your sin. Turn your life over to God and let him lead. Are you ready to, ready to do that today? Are you ready to put your faith in Jesus? Everyone's on a journey, and there's, some, there's a, a, at least a couple of you here today that today's your day. If, you, if you're ready to put your faith in Jesus, become his apprentice, live for him, would you raise your hand? If you're in the room, raise your hand. And online, would you raise your hand to God? He can see you. And I want to just lead you in a prayer. Would you repeat after me and say it to Jesus? Jesus, I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new and make me grateful. I choose to follow you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. 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 And if you prayed that prayer today, would you just text the word, text the word restart to our texting phone number 97,000, and that'll let me know. And we want to keep praying for you. God bless you. Thanks, Pastor Garen. Man, I, yeah, let's give him a hand. Give the Lord a hand, too. <laughs> I want to be the kind of worshiper like that woman, don't you? Oh, man, let's pursue it. Let's pursue Jesus with that same kind of love, that same kind of heart of gratitude. Amen? Amen. Well, again, if you're new with us, would you just either text GREET to 97000, or you can fill it out on the Connect card in front of you. Um, you can also check um, I Followed the Lord on the Connect card as well. And if you're joining us online, would you just hit that subscribe button? All that does is help other people hear about the good news of Jesus. Um, and for those of you who are staying, um, we would love your help. We just need to take a couple of rows out of the front to make room for um, Together Nights tonight, which you're all invited to, um, tonight at 6 p.m. I love you guys, and I will see you all next week.